So let's talk a little bit about DX and the primary focus is going to be how to get QSLs. Then we'll talk a little bit about DX, but let me let me just talk about DX for a moment. From the very beginning of ham radio, DX has been the foundational activity of ham radio from day one. If you had a spark gap transmitter and made a contact with somebody in the next town over, that was DX, man. That was distance. And as the years have gone past, those distances have lengthened. But you think back in the 20s when we had the American Radio Relay League because the way you sent messages from one coast to another was to contact one station who relayed your message to another station who relayed to another station. Today we think nothing of having direct conversations with somebody on the West Coast or in fact practically any place in the world that somebody has a reasonable station set up. So the, the whole concept of DX has evolved over the years, but it is really the fundamental facet of amateur radio that brings everything together. I, I use the term, and it's been used by other, it's the magic of ham radio. And for DX, for some of you who operate on two meters, it may be working a repeater way down the valley that you've never been able to reach before. It may be if you're operating on six meters, heavens to Betsy, contacting a station in Europe on six meters when usually it's fairly local within a few hundred miles. And for some of us, DX is contacting, and you all heard a presentation last year, Heard Island, way down in the South Indian Ocean near Antarctica. So regardless of our interest in ham radio, today DX still is the primary facet of our hobby that holds us together. And it contributes to many other facets of ham radio. Let me ask you the question. When you're operating in an emergency situation, public service, you probably have some operators who are, I'd call them the go-to guys, the ones who can handle a lot of messages, quickly grasp what's being said at the other side, of the, from the other end, get it down on a piece of paper, convey messages both incoming and outgoing. There are probably some go-to guys in this club when it comes to public service operations. My bet is those go-to guys are also DXers. And the reason is because the DXer learns to listen carefully, how to tune the radio, is very focused on grasping the message that's being sent from the other end, is very focused on communicating either through a key or through voice or a keyboard, communicating out or outbound in a very clear and concise manner. Those skills that you learn DXing, whether it's local DXing on two meters or six meters or around the world, those skills that you learn help us all in other phases of ham radio that are important to us. So with that background and that pitch to support and promote DXing, and I'm going to come back and talk about how to work DX in a little while, but let's talk about QSL since that's what I was asked to talk about. Well, what is this thing called a QSL? A confirmation card. The sending of QSL cards again goes back to the very beginning of amateur radio to spark gap days. It's traditional. 
It's part of a hobby. And as Larry as I was taught, were talking at dinner time, I've got boxes of QSLs all neatly indexed. And you'd think, okay, never looks at them again. You know, I go through those QSL cards and it's memories. It brings back memories. It brings back incidents to me. It's the, and I'm sorry I didn't bring them with me this evening. I should have gone through my cards and pulled out cards from back in the late 50s, early 60s, when I was on 75 meter phone and spoke regularly with guys in Charlottesville. I have good memories about that. W4JD, W4JDS. I mean, I go down the list of people that I used to talk to, Tom, Mac, and a lot of other people. It brings back memories. It, it's, I guess I'm a traditionalist. I think traditions hold the world together. New traditions are fine, but I like traditions. I think they bring us together, and QSLs reinforce the tradition of ham radio. Well, this day and age, what kind of QSLs? There are paper carts, the old traditional paper carts. They're still very much in use. They're still exchanged all over the world. And it's a good, reliable way. And in fact, paper cards are still required for a lot of awards that recognize achievements that you've made in terms of working DX, working states, countries, counties, 3,000 and some counties, believe it or not. And there are hundreds of people that have worked every county in the United States. That's DX for them, working every county in the United States. Then there are electronic converse, confirmations. It's new. It's fast. It's actually less expensive than exchanging paper QSL cards. It has a lot of advantages. It has some disadvantages as well, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. One primary disadvantage is that electronic QSLs don't work for a lot of awards that you might want to apply to. Someday they will, but today they don't. I call it the hybrid approach, and this is, this is even newer. People have combined the two where you can send your QSL electronically and in return for a modest cost, less than it would cost to send an envelope overseas and put some postage in the envelope, you get a paper card back in the mail, and you also get an electronic confirmation through Logbook of the World, which we're going to talk about. This is great. If, if the hybrid approach is available to you, use it. A serious DXer. Let's take Jim sitting back here. He uses all three of these methods. Now, let's act like a DX meeting for a moment, and let me get a gauge how many of you have cards confirming contacts with 100 countries? Okay, not many. How about 200? How about 300? How about 339? No, how many? 335, okay, that's darn good. You got four to go. No, 305. Oh, 305, okay, fine, okay. There are today 339, we call them entities. Since some of these little islands certainly can't be considered to be countries, and some big ones like Alaska can't be considered a country, but it is considered a separate entity as far as the DX awards are concerned. So there are 339 today. So let's talk about this. How do you decide if you do paper cards, electronic cards, or the hybrid cards? The best advice I can give you, and, and take this to heart, you've got to listen 
to what the DX station tells you because the DX station will often advise you if you want a card from me this is the way to get it. You have gotta listen to that and follow those instructions. If you don't there's a high probability you will not get a card. There are a number of places where you can look like online call books like QRZ.com and the person if they've paid attention will probably write something on their QRZ.com website that says here's how to QSL with me. And finally there are a lot of good newsletters and QST, the ARRL DX News, the OPDX Bulletin, 425 DX Newsletters. There are a lot of places online where you can find information about how to QSL with stations. Look and listen for those instructions and follow those instructions. Now let me start with some general guidelines and this goes to whether you're interested in QSLs or not. Log every contact you make. I know it's not required by the FCC regulations anymore. Used to be, but it's not anymore. But my advice to you is log every contact you make. Paper log is okay, but again my advice would be use an electric log, computerized log. <clears throat> there are many good ones, free ones, that you can grab off the internet for either a Windows or Apple, Apple environment. Find a logging program and install it and log all of your contacts. And use universal time or Greenwich Mean Time or Zulu or whatever you want to call it. If you send a card to somebody in Japan and tell them that the contact was at 8.30 p.m. in Charlottesville, Virginia, they won't have a clue what time it was. You've got to use universal time. Keep your log in universal time. Paper cards. Okay. Rule number one, make sure that the card that you send is accurate and complete. That's just vital. It seems obvious. I get cards all the time that have missing information, incorrect information, card must be accurate and complete. Rule number two, you got to make it easy and inexpensive for the DX station to respond to you. Assume they don't need your card. They've got thousands and thousands of cards from stations in the United States. They don't need your card. They will send you a card as, as a favor but you've got to make it easy and expensive for them to respond. Rule number three, you've got to make it easy and inexpensive for them to respond. And I meant to be repeatable. If you use a two-sided card like I do, picture on the front, QSO information on the back, make sure your call sign appears on both sides of the card. If you make an error when you're filling out the card, don't make a correction. Don't cross anything out. Don't initial anything. Rip up the card and fill out another card. Because a program with high integrity like DXCC will not accept a card that has any corrections on it. So if you make a mistake, tear up the card and start over again. Fancy cards, I know this is kind of fancy. Fancy cards do very little to increase your rate of return. And again, follow the presumption the DX station doesn't need your card. He'll respond as a courtesy. Where do you send your card? Well, you can send it direct to the DX. Again, follow the instructions. But here are the general, general ways. You send it direct to the DX station. And there are several ways to do that, and I want to talk about that. You can send it to a QSL manager. This is the best. If that station has a QSL manager, somebody who represents that DX station, in other words, I talk to a station in Europe, and he tells me that Jim is his QSL manager. 
I don't send my car to Europe, I send it to Jim. The station in Europe has sent a copy of his log to Jim. Jim looks it up, says, aha, I only have to mail my car to Charlottesville instead of, mail instead of mailing it to Edinburgh. And the postage to get it back from Charlottesville is a lot less than the postage to get it back from Edinburgh. So if there is a QSL manager, that is the best possible situation. Use the QSL manager if there is one. Then these are both fairly fast. Direct to the DX station using a QSL manager, fast, efficient. The ARRL QSL Bureau is cheap. You box up a bunch of cards, you send them to the ARRL, and they then separate them and put them into hundreds of boxes and they mail those out to QSL bureaus all over the world and then those QSL bureaus send the cards out to their members who have subscribed and maybe that member will then send a card back to the Radio Society of Great Britain who will send it to the ARRL who will send it to their QSL bureau and if you want a card, it'll take a year, two years. You get cards from way back when through the QSL Bureau. But it costs almost nothing to use if you are willing to wait for the card. These methods cost postage. And they cost postage in both directions. Remember, make it as inexpensive as possible for the station on the other end to respond. And the way you do that is you send them the means to put the stamp on the envelope that they're going to mail back to you. So this is the cheap way, but a very, very slow way. These have a high rate of return. These have a low rate of return. You just don't get many cards back because very few stations will follow this very long, very circuitous path to exchange cards with another station. If you're going to mail your QSLs, <clears throat> I highly recommend use what we would call nesting envelopes. It's kind of a neat thing. It's two envelopes that look the same but guess what? One is a little smaller than the other one. So that that envelope will slide inside the larger envelope and seal it up and mail it. On that inner envelope, you put your address. This is the return envelope don't put any stamps on it. In Greece you can't mail a letter using stamps from the United States or any other country. So what you do inside this thing is that you put your QSL card. You put a green stamp. You hear hams talk about green stamps Folks, it's a dollar bill. It's the way that they can pay for a stamp in their country, stick it on your envelope, and put it in the mailbox. To be honest with you, in most countries, an airmail stamp, like it does in the United States, costs more than a dollar. So the typical standard these days is put two dollars in the envelope. If you still have them, you can use an international reply coupon. You used to be able to buy these at the post office. You can't anymore. And they're not accepted in the United States. U.S. is out of the international reply coupon business. But if you still have some in your drawer, keep them and use them because there are a lot of company, countries that will still accept them. So you put green stamps or an IRC in the envelope. You seal it in so you don't seal it. 
you put the inner envelope in, and here's a little trick. When you put the envelope in, put the flap side at the bottom of the envelope. Don't put it in this way, where you've got both flaps at the top, because when the guy uses his gizmo to open up the envelope, he'll cut the flap off the outer envelope, or the inside envelope also. So turn this envelope and put the flap down at the bottom of the envelope. And then seal up the outer envelope and put an international airmail stamp on the envelope. You can buy forever stamps. They cost $1.15. And you put it in the mail. That's how you send out QSL cards by mail. Never put a call sign on either envelope. Either your call sign or the DX station's call sign. It's a signal for thieves to say, hmm, QSL card, ham radio operator, I see the call letters, take the envelope to the back room, slice it open, take the money out of it, maybe put the envelope back in the mail. Never put a call sign on either envelope. Return postage. There's a guy that sell you can also, if you have some stamps from France, and you know the right amount, you can stick some stamps in this envelope, and when the guy in France gets it, he'll take those stamps, stick them on the envelope, and mail it back to you. In some cases, that's the best way to get a card, but I will tell you, it's only in a few cases. I don't recommend it unless the DX station suggests that to you. I'll also tell you there's another extreme case. And that is, if you've worked somebody in, well, our friend had some contacts with a station in Libya. Well, you know what's going on in Libya today. Getting mail to Libya is a major problem. The only way to have a decent chance of getting your letter delivered is to send it by registered mail. You know how expensive registered mail is here in the United States? It's even more expensive if you're sending a registered letter overseas. But it does work if you're in an extreme situation where you've got to get an envelope to somebody in an area like Libya. Electronic. Well, computers are invading every facet of ham radio, and QSLing is certainly no exception. The use is rapidly expanding. It's fast to get a card. It's relatively inexpensive. This is all good. ARRL's logbook of the world, we're going to talk about it because there have been a lot of criticisms because people say it's too complicated and don't want to fool with it. We're going to try and simplify it for you tonight at least a little bit. The logbook of the world is the gold standard, and it's gold standard because it's very secure. Everything is encrypted. Nobody can get in. Once the logs are stored at ARRL, nobody can get in there and fiddle with the logs. So nobody can cheat and get credit for contacts that they never made. They have really focused on security and integrity, and that's the reason that it's a little bit complex to get started in using Logbook of the World. The matches where the logbook from another station and the logbook from your station are compared, and when they find the same data in both logbooks, that match is considered an electronic QSL. It works great. But it's only usable for awards, primarily ARRL, like DXCC, the VHF UH, UHS Century Club worked all states, and CQ Magazines worked all prefix awards. A lot of other awards have not yet gone and signed up to use Logbook of the World as an input mechanism. There's some other options. EQSL is probably the most popular one. They're fun, but they just simply do not, cannot be used to qualify for any of the awards like DXCC or Work to All States or Work to All Zones or any of the other important awards, do not accept so-called confirmations from EQSLs. It's too easy to fool EQSL and, and claim a contact 
It really wasn't made. What's the downside of Logbook of the World? Well, it's a little bit complicated to get started. But once you've done it and uploaded your log for the first time and check your credits, it's pretty easy. And in fact, after once or twice actually uploading your log and looking at your credits becomes kind of automatic and it only takes a few seconds and you won't even have to think about it. But the first time you go through it, you got to pay attention. A lot of DX stations don't use Logbook of the World yet. There are two reasons. They haven't gotten around to it, or they think it's complicated, or frankly, they like green stamps. <laughs> They like the dollar bills that people send to them. You send them two dollars, the stamp only costs them a dollar, and they stick the other green stamp in their pockets. They like that. That's some, one of the reasons that a lot of stations overseas have not signed up for Logbook of the World. So, how do you get started? And I don't even think I need my pointer since it's kind of in the right spot. The first thing you do is go to the internet, to the ARRL website, and right at the top you can select Logbook of the World, and there's a help file, and it will invite you to download the TQSL application. When I first started this, there were several applications. It was really, it was really complicated. Today, you download a single application that does all the things that you need to do. Download and install that application, run the application, and it will offer to request a call sign certificate. Press that button. It's electronically going to send a message over the internet to the ARRL. The staff is going to look at that, and they're going to press a button, and believe it or not, the next step is that the ARRL is going to send you an old-fashioned postcard. Here it is, Logbook of the World. And on the front of that postcard, there's going to be an eight-digit password. This one happens to be an eight, eight whatever. There's a password right beside your address on this postcard that you receive. Don't lose it. It's very important. Take that postcard and here we go. Run the TQSL, that same program that you used to send the request which resulted in the postcard. Run TQSL again and it will ask you to enter the password from your postcard. Do that. It'll again communicate with ARRL over the internet and it will generate a certificate for your call sign. And then along the process here, they're going to ask you for your name and your address and your call sign. And the ARRL is going to send you a second file. It's called it has on the end of a TQ6, like a DOC or a TXT or whatever. It's a .tq6 file. They're going to send that to you. That's your certificate. You double click on the icon of that TQ6 file and it is going to tell you your call sign certificate is valid. And at that point you have installed Logbook of the World. You have done everything you need at ARRL computers to install Logbook of the World and you are ready to use it. It's a few steps, it takes a few days, I mean you gotta wait for the mail to come to get this postcard. And why do they do that? Because they don't want somebody fooling the system of requesting a certificate in your name and having that certificate sent to them, meanwhile you're sitting there oblivious to the whole thing, they put this in the mail to you, to your FCC call address to make sure 
that they are communicating with the right individual when they send them this password. Again, security. Back up that TQ6 file. That's the thing that you need to encrypt all of your logs. Once you've done all of that, you can now use Logbook of the World. Now, I've talked about passwords. And boy, this one, this one, I got messed up. So I'm going to advise you right up front. There are four different passwords involved in all this stuff. The first one is the password that you probably already have that you log on to the ARRL website and look at all the things that they have. You will need that to log on to the ARRL website. That has nothing to do with Logbook of the World. It's just getting on the ARRL website. The second password is the postcard password. You'll use that one once, but keep the card. <laughs> Third, they're going to ask you, the TQSL program is going to ask you to select a password that will be used to sign your log. Signing meaning it's going to encrypt it. And it's going to encrypt it in a manner that is unique to you so that nobody else can crack that log file. You need, you make up a password, write it down. I write all of my passwords down on this card so I keep them all in one place. Then if you want to get on and look at all your Logbook of the World data, you need to log on to the Logbook of the World computer. That's another password that you get to select. Write it down. Those four passwords and you'll obtain them in that order. Now you're ready to submit contacts to the Logbook of the World. You really, you got to do it electronically. This is an electronic QSL methodology. So your log has to be, exist in electronic format, not on a piece of paper. Every, every logging program has a file, has, a, has a, an application in it, a utility, which will convert your logging data into something called an ADIF format. You can also use Cabrillo, which is used by contest logging programs primarily. But they have to get the logs into either one of those two formats, and your logging program will do that automatically. You press a couple of buttons, and it will automatically create a file, an ADF file, for example, w3dry.adi. Start the TQSL program and point to that file that was just generated, w3dry.adi, or your call, whatever, that you wish to submit the A double uh, to Logbook of the World. TQSL will take care of everything else. It will encrypt the log, it will sign the log, and it will automatically upload it to the Logbook of the World application in Newington, Connecticut. It all happens automagically. It's very simple to do. If you get lost, there's a lot of help. And there's a help tab, tab that you can press. Then all you need to do is log on to the Logbook of the World website, and you'll see all the matches. Soon as your log, and it sometimes takes a few seconds, a few minutes. If it's right after a large contest, it could take a few hours because they're processing a lot of logs. But generally, in a very short amount of time, you can log on to the Logbook of the World website, and you can see how many times your logbook has matched all the other logbooks that have ever been submitted thousands, tens of thousands of logbooks, and millions upon millions of QSOs, and you'll see how many of your contacts match contacts in any other log that's ever been submitted. It's great. And you immediately say, ah, this many entities on these bands, single side bands, CW, digital mode, 
It's all presented in nice charts. You can go in and look at the detail and you can see exactly what time those contacts happened. It's great. And I spend lots of time just in there fooling around, analyzing the data, looking for things amidst all of the contacts that I've gotten. Now, I said not everybody uses it. My experience is of the QSOs that I have uploaded, about 40% of them have been matched in Logbook of the World. That's not real high. The more recent those contacts are, the higher the percentage. More have been matched that have contacts that have been made more recently. I tried an experiment. I just really got interested in digital radio teletype about three, four years ago. And I decided I wasn't going to send out any cards. I was just going to see how many confirmations I would get through Logbook of the World. I've gotten about 85% of the contacts confirmed through Logbook of the World. Now, you might imagine the guys that are operating in a digital mode, like radio teletype, are probably more computer savvy and probably more likely to use Logbook of the World, and you'd be exactly right. But I do think it's interesting that the potential is out there to get very high rates of return from Logbook of the World, and those rates of return are continuing to grow. You have everything you need to use Logbook of the World. You upload, you see all kinds of charts. You don't have to apply for awards. DXing is not a contest. I mean, there are lots of contests, DX contests and different things that you can participate in that are highly competitive. DXing is not competitive. It's competitive only from an internal standpoint of seeing how well you can do as an individual with your equipment, with your skills. So, <clears throat> I just, I'll offer that to you. A lot of the expeditions today, most of them, make it possible for you to know almost immediately whether you are in the log. If you think you worked them, when the guys were on Heard Island a few months ago, this is down in the middle of nowhere, south of uh, south of India, down near Antarctica. I mean the most remote spot you can think of. Guys, I could sit at the computer, I made a contact, and with a minute or two, here is a website that is being fed from data from Heard Island over a satellite telephone, and I see my call appearing on the computer and a line is drawn between my location and Heard Island, and boom, I've made a contact. And they are acknowledging it in almost real time. Boy, this is different. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, you worked Gus Browning or somebody in some remote island over in the Indian Ocean, and you didn't know if he copied your call sign correctly until months and months later when he got back to North Carolina and got around to going through his handwritten log and seeing if he could find your call sign. Now you know almost instantly. It's really, really neat. A lot of the logs are often linked, to some, often linked to something called the online QSL request system. If this is offered, use it. It's really good. You type your call letter in to this, on this website, and you say, okay, I want to search the logs of VK0EK. That was the station at Heard Island. I want to type in W3DRY, and immediately it opens up and it gives a list of all the contacts that I had with VK0EK. It doesn't say what time, doesn't say what day, so I can't copy it and claim a contact. It just says W3DRY had a, an 80 meter contact with VK0EK and a 40 meter contact. 
And if I want to order a QSL, I press a button, and now it asks me, okay, what time was this contact? What day was this contact? I must, I must know the details. And if my details are correct when I fill them in and press the button, it says, contacts confirmed, do you want to order a QSL card? And you say yes, and it says, okay, we'll confirm up to 10 contacts or 20 contacts or whatever. And uh, to offset our costs and pay the postage, it's going to cost you five bucks. Use PayPal. You press the button, you transmit the five bucks, and in the case of VK0EK, this is unbelievable. In the case of VK0EK, still down on that island in the middle of nowhere, I press the button to confirm, and within a few hours, I had, con I had confirmation on Logbook of the World. I had worked it and could con con claim, claim credit for working that island, which I had never worked before. They were still down there in the cold working stations, and I had a way to press a button and I could get official confirmation from my DXCC record and it was all done electronically. It's great. And the five bucks, less than it would have cost me to send a letter overseas, enclose some green stamps, and get it back from them. In addition to doing this logbook of the world thing, you can collect paper cards and mail those cards to the AWRL or CQ Magazine or the Radio Society of Great Britain or the German Amateur Radio Club if you want to apply for awards. Or you can have the cards verified by a volunteer card checker who is certified by the award sponsor. And in my case, I check cards for AWRL. If any of you have cards that you want checked for DXCC, worked all states, worked all continents, any of the AWRL awards, let me know. I can check the cards locally. They never leave your hands. It's quick and it costs nothing to have your cards checked. I even mail the application to AWRL headquarters. Now, let's talk briefly about how to work some DX. First, a big time station is not necessary. It is just not. I've never had a big time station. I've never had an antenna other than a wire cut for the 80 meter band, ever. No towers, no beams, no quads, an 80 meter wire. This can be done. The thing that is essential is that you've got to be patient and you've got to be a smart operator. Everybody tells you you've got to listen, and indeed you do have to do a lot of listening, a lot of careful listening. You have to sense and understand the operator on the other end, if you listen carefully, is going to give you clues on what to do and how to work that station. You've got to follow those directions. The thing I will add to it is that timing is absolutely critical. When the station on the other end says, this is VK0EK, QRZ, like, call me. You've got to know where to call, what frequency, and you've got to know when to call. The timing is vital because there's a rhythm, particularly in a big pileup, particularly with a good operator. A good operator will establish a rhythm of operating, and a good operator will be making four, four contacts a minute. I mean, it all happens very quickly. And you've got to grasp the rhythm of what is happening, and you've got to know on what frequency to call, and you've got to know when to call. The timing is critical. If you don't do it at the right time, you're either calling before that station is listening or after that station has already picked somebody else's call out of the pileup and is giving a report to them while you're here sending your call letters. 
You've got to get the timing down right. Timing is very, very critical in working DX. Okay, a few hints. I want to, this is going to surprise some of you. This is the best money I ever spent on ham radio. All the radios, all the antennas, all the accessories, having this is the best money I ever spent on ham radio. It helps you to hear clearly. It helps you to speak clearly. I, I've told Bob Heil, who I bought these from at Heil, Heil, Heil Audio, it cost me a couple hundred dollars. Don't buy cheap ones. Buy something good. But I highly recommend this is the best money of anything I ever bought for ham radio. This is it. I highly recommend it. You can compensate for a modest antenna ad power. I mean, I live in a restricted community. As Larry said, <coughs> I've always lived in a restricted community since I moved to the Washington area in the, in the late 1960s. I have never lived anywhere but an antenna restricted. I've never been allowed to put up a tower. I've never been allowed to put up a big antenna. But in 1974, I built a Heath SB220 kilowatt amplifier. It cost me about $400. That, antenna, that amplifier, which I bought in 74, lasted me 40 years. I had to put new 3-500Zs in it a couple of times, but it lasted me all that time. I finally blew up the main band switch on the thing and decided it wasn't worth fixing. <coughs> An amplifier will compensate for having a poor antenna, and I highly recommend it, and you can buy amplifiers that are not expensive. During popular contests, if you're trying to maximize and work new countries, I call it cherry picking. <coughs> I like the CQ contest, phone and CW, which happen in October, November of each year. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen to what's going on. There's going to be a lot of countries on there that you have never worked before. During the first few hours, all the big guns will be working each other. Just listen. But during the second day of the contest, all those stations are going to be calling CQ, CQ, and wait for somebody to call them. Cherry pick. Don't try and work as many stations as you can. Listen for stations that you've never worked before. Cherry pick. Back around 2000, I looked at my DXCC totals, and I saw that I had over 100 countries confirmed on 10, 15, 20, and 80. <coughs> the only contact, only band that I, I had one country confirmed on 40 meters, the United States. I got on the CQ Worldwide <coughs> CW contest in November, in November, and by the 1st of February, I had cards from over 100 countries. I worked most of them in the CQ contest, cherry picking. It is a great way to work countries you've never worked before on various bands. I highly recommend it. It's, if you're listening for a pilot, if you're trying to work like I was, Heard Island. The pileups were massive. I'll tell you, it's easier to work a CW pileup than it is a single sideband pileup. And I will tell you, you do not have to be an expert in CW to work DX in a situation where a QSO lasts for 10 or 15 seconds. If you can copy your own call sign that's all you need 
to work CWDX. I am no CW expert, but I'm on CW honor roll. Man, I'm no CW expert. Everybody that has a knowledge of CW is capable of working CW. Not to have a rag chew. Heavens, I can't rag chew at high speed on CW. I just can't. <coughs> but I've worked and confirmed almost every, every entity on CW. But I'm no rag chewer on CW. I'm incapable of it. You do not need to be a great CW operator to work a lot of stuff in a CW contest. Every time I go into my room where my computer is and my radio is, I log on to a DX cluster. A packet cluster that shows, and there are many of them on the internet, that just gives me a list of what's being reported as what's on the air and who's working them. It gives me a sense of what propagation conditions are, who is able to work what. I just I learn something very quickly about what's happening on the bands by looking, even if I don't turn my radio on. I may only turn my radio on if I see something interesting on the cluster. Try the reverse beacon network. There was an article in QST about this recently. It's neat. And you all should give it a try. It's amazing. I tried, well, I never used it before. I tried what they suggested in CQ magazine, or in QST magazine. I went down at the bottom of a 40 meter band, it was 40 or 80 or something, one evening, night. I called a quick CQ. I was logged on to the reverse beacon network. This is a bunch of automated receivers all over the world that are listening using a special program that copies CW over some wide area or reasonably wide area. It's a big digital signal processing gizmo. I called CQ. The CQ, CQ, W3DRY, W3DRY, and I did them within seconds up on the computer starts popping up. W3DRY, CQ, some receiver in England heard me. W3DRY, CQ, some receiver in Italy heard me. W3DRY, some receiver in Panama heard me. You, um, you get inst you had to have a, have, haven't had a QSO with anybody, but you just send a little, or you can send CQ test and sign your call sign to it, and these automated receivers will report it to this website, and you can see every place that your signal is being heard, and they give you the signal-to-noise ratio of how strong your signal is versus the noise background, and immediately, if the bands are dead, you do this, and you get no reports back, and you say, don't worry about radio now, or you may think the bands are dead and you try this reverse beacon thing and you get reports back from all over the place that the bands are alive, there's just nobody there. Try the reverse beacon network, it's amazing and it gives you a lot of good information. When a big D expedition comes on, my advice is, <clears throat> guys, I'm not a big gun, I've got this wire antenna the big guns are going to get the contacts first. But everybody should try to get at least one contact because the weather gets bad and these folks have to leave this island and you're stuck because you were going to wait till things quieted down a little bit. Try and get one contact. Then relax and wait until later in the de expedition and go back and try and work them some on the other bands. If you're stuck with low power and a not so great antenna, PSK. Phase shift king is great. Everybody uses low power and signals are copyable when to the ear you can't even hear them because the signal processing pulls the signal up out of the noise and decodes it. It's like radio teletype but it's, it's, it's really good. If you have no other way of getting on and there's a ton of stuff, ton of stations that are using PSK now. Work some good DX by checking. There are some DX nets on the air. People kind of, the big timers frown on it and say, ah. 
Let me tell you, the first time I ever, there's a one station in a, this entity called Mount Athos. Well, it's on the shore, it's a rock up on the side of the mountain in Greece, up in northern Greece, and there's a bunch of monasteries there. And the only people that live there are monks. And one of them has got a ham radio license, Monk Apollo. Monk Apollo has a license, and one, e one afternoon, I'm sitting there on a DX net, and who checks in but Monk Apollo? We've been friends ever since. You meet some nice people, you work some good DX, and when Monk Apollo checks in, they say, W3DRY, your turn, give him a call. Everybody else shuts up and I call. Then the next station, you know, W2PVY, your turn, give him a call. It's relaxed, it's friendly, and you can work some darn good DX checking into these nets. For casual rag chews, the 30, 17, 12 meters are, are bands of choice. And again, playing this contest thing, I look for single sideband contacts when all the big boys are busy during a CW contest. They're all down in the CW portion of the band beating each other up. I go up on the sideband and all the little guys trying to work them. I go up the upper end of the band and sideband where there is no contest and there's a few friendly stations on up there and I can have a nice contact and have a nice conversation with them. Yep. Finally, <clears throat> contact me if you have cards, you want to have verified locally. I really enjoy doing it. I'm going to suggest to you, those of you that are big time DXers, make a donation to some of these expeditions. Heard Island costs over a half a million dollars. Oh, big money. Send them a little donation, a little extra donation when you send a card to them, or even before they go. And finally, it's all fun, and it's magic. I hope you enjoy it. So that's the pitch. Let's see if anybody has any questions, and I'll shut up. Uh, yes? Uh, when you contact the X station in Alaska or Hawaii, and you want to send QSL, rather than put a green stamp in how much you can put the U.S. I tell you, for any station in the United States, <laughs> Alaska, Hawaii included, and Puerto Rico, and Guam and all those other possessions where you can use U.S. stamps, I put a self-addressed stamped envelope in the envelope so that all they have to do is stick the card in the envelope, seal it up, and send it back to me. Yeah, I always use SASEs. I, even here in the United States, I don't expect the guy to put a stamp on the envelope if I really want a card. If all I'm doing is sending a card to him or her and I, I don't care whether I get a card back or not, just send them a card. Incidentally, when I started out, every card was a postcard. I mean, they wrote something on the back of it, your address was on the back of it, they stuck a stamp on the upper, upper right-hand corner. I haven't gotten a postcard-style QSL in years and years. That's done. That's back to the old days. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Yeah, send an SASE here in the United States if you want a return card. Yes? Two um, questions. Where did the TQSL program come from that you said you used to upload? And secondly, would you mind mentioning what sort of logging software you use? I would. Be happy to. TQSL was designed by some contractors that were hired by ARRL. It is a program that is uh, copyrighted by, uh, by ARRL. So it's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not, not an open domain program. And when you download it, there's a license to use that comes along with it like any other software that is copyrighted by somebody else. Logging program, I happen to use a program called Logger32. Logger 30, numeral 32, with no other punctuation in the thing. But there are, there are many of them out there, and I mean... And 3FKP. There you go. He's got his... 
I mean, there are many. Uh, Pardon? Which one did you name? M3 FJP. Oh, yeah. Just say, yeah. That's the one we use at field day. Yeah. There are some that are, what is it, N1MM that everybody uses in contests. That one's so, so very pointed toward and is absolutely great for contests and de-expedition stations that are logging many, many contacts very quickly. Uh, but uh, there are many. He's got a good one. I use Logger because I've just used it forever. And it sort of suits my purposes. Joe? Uh, you know, you verify this with the time. You're verifying you want a QSL card. you got to send in your call and your time and all that. What happens if the guy on one end says, I'm, well, I work at DIY at 1604 and you said 1606? Uh, there's a, there's a, an acceptable band. Oh. Uh, they don't have to be exact. Uh, there's an acceptable band of time that is acceptable to declare it a match. It's a good question, Joe. They do not have to be precise. Obviously, the date has to be right, and we know it has to be something within the same hour, but what, the, what, that, what that bandwidth is, uh, nobody knows. Only the computer knows. <laughs> <laughs> It's not talking. The computer's not talking. It's not te the computer's not revealing what the. No, the computer doesn't tell you. <laughs> Although the computer, when it when it comes back, will tell you the time that was recorded on lo on logbook of the world. When it confirms the QSO and you press the button and look at the details, it will report the time. This is after success has been achieved. Uh, you ask for the QSO details, and it will tell you the time in the logbook. Yes? The logging programs I use don't generally uh, generate a real format. Is it some programs are just to convert Rillio to use to submit? Or convert or what? Cabrillo format. Cabrillo? Yeah. Cabrillo works fine. I know, but programs I use don't generate. You don't need Cabrillo. Use ADIF. And will contests accept that? Like, like oh, the AWRL contests? I'm looking for Cabrillo generally. Uh, but the, uh, logbook. Contest logbook. logging programs like N1MM generate Cabrillo files. I don't, I don't, I other log, other log programs, Logger32, for example, will let me choose if I say export log, and I say what format you want to use. You want to use Cabrillo, you want to use ADIF, you want to use comrade, CSV, comrade, comma separated yeah. uh, variables, it'll let you pick. But one of the things that lets me pick is ADIF, and that's one that ARRL accepts, and so I select that one, it generates an ADI file, and then I automatically upload it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes. I installed in my attic a converted V long wired antenna for 20 meters. Okay. Now I want to do 40 meters. <laughs> do I want to go through the pain of walking through all that insulation and not going through the ceiling again? Or do I want to buy an antenna tuner to enable me to use the same antenna for 40? I will, I will tell you that you can take a long antenna and use an antenna tuner to make it work pretty darn well on higher frequency bands. The reverse of using an antenna on a band that requires a longer antenna is a much dicier deal. So my first advice to you would be find a way to put up a 40 meter antenna. That's what I would suggest to you. Now I'll tell you a little story. Here's my 80 meter Wyndham. It took me a while, folks, because my old SB220 was not usable. It didn't have that 120 meters on the band switch, so I had no amplifier. So I was running 100 watts using an 80 meter antenna, and I worked DXCC on 160. It can be done. 
listen, timing, it can be done, but it's not easier. The most comfortable thing for you to do and the most success that you'll have is put up a 40 meter antenna and don't worry if it has to bend around a ways to get that total length in. Get the length of wire up in the air and then let your antenna tuner take care of any impedance mismatches, but get the wire up there is my advice to you. Yeah. Okay, I think time we've got to go and it's probably ending right there, but thank you very much. Thank you all.